Number 602, 602, sweet by and by. <clears throat> 602. Let us sing. We've been looking at the fruit of peace and um, got down to, I marked Romans 14, 19 is where we got to. But before we get over to that, the second paragraph at the very beginning of, the, of lesson five goes back to the a definition we gave for peace. It says, peace is said to be a fruit that comes into a Christian's life as they continue in an obedient faith. Peace is the opposite of discord 
strife or dissension. A lot of times you can learn what something is by what it's opposite of. It's the opposite of discord, strife, or dissension. Peace comes when there is unity and harmony. A soul in rebellion against God cannot have peace with God. Peace can only come when there is harmony between God and man. A lot of people want to be at peace with God, and, and they, they stress the love of God and the forgiveness of God, but they're, they're not in harmony with God and God's will. They're really not at peace. I mean, they may claim it. We talked about false peace and um, just the world's idea of peace or whatever. But we live in a world that's filled with a lack of peace. We live in a world that is full of discord, strife, or dissension. I was talking to somebody beforehand said, uh, you know, watching a little bit of the politics and was it Iowa where they had the caucuses and I, I read some conservative news and this time how big of a victory Trump had in Iowa and um, the record amount that he won by. Then I turned to some other news that was from a never Trumper per type person. Um, they used to be conservative, but he hates Trump and he was like, an unusually low amount of interest because the turnout was so low. Didn't mention the weather or anything, the blizzards or whatever else. Just said low turnout. He barely got above the majority. And, and so it depends on how you look at it. Two people look at the same thing. One hollers, boy, it's just pit he's pitiful. The other, look how wonderful it is. There's discord there, total disagreement. Um, you know, there's hatred even and a lot of strife. In the religious world, you can see some of the same thing as well. You can see a lot of dissension, a lot of discord, and yet we're supposed to be at peace with God. We're supposed to be at peace as much as we can. Um, we read in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So as much as we can, we strive to be at peace with man, but ultimately to be at peace with God. Why is peace so important? Why have peace? Why live at peace? I mean, I know God says to, but why is that so important for us to, to be at peace? So we can sleep at night? Okay. It's kind of, if you have a guilty conscience or a troubled mind or a lot of anger, it's hard to sleep, isn't it? Yeah, just looking over your shoulder. And I, I'm repeating that because sometimes people can't hear. I, I've learned I can hear when people are talking this way, but you may not hear that way and then online as well people don't always hear the comments from the peanut gallery or whichever way you want to say it is the audience but um, yeah um, to be able to sleep at night to sleep knowing that you're in the right relationship with God to be at sleep to be at sleep knowing you're doing the best that you can do to be at peace with all people um, other thoughts why live at peace yes Okay, I mean, yeah, if you want to have, you have to have peace, try to strive to be at peace with them if you want to be able to, to, to reach out to them and, and to help. What does it say? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. What was said back here? Okay, that's the time that people have the most positive growth, okay? Um, you know, now, there's a, was it Amos that said, woe to those who are at ease in Zion? I mean, some, you know, there's a difference between being at ease and being at peace. You know, at ease is, boy, eat, drink, and be merry. We have plenty of everything, beds of ivory, the music, the best drinks, whatever else, and um, just taking it easy, thinking about me, me, me. Peace, the world can be falling apart around us, but we can still be at peace. And so, um, any other thoughts? Okay, you, a divided house cannot stand. I mean, yeah. um, they accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, and you know, I mean, he how you know he said, "Can Satan cast out Satan?" That doesn't make sense. That was in a negative way of of a, of a divided house, but on a positive side, you know, how can we reach the world if we're, we don't strive to be united and to love one another? Other thoughts.
you, every time I hear that passage, when we was in chorus, we always closed with that. And it makes me want to just, you have, almost have to keep, make yourself read it instead of sing it. But it's a beautiful thought. It, I mean, it's a beautiful blessing, and that is of, of peace that's there. Um, okay, peace offerings. Okay. I mean, it was important to have peace with God, wasn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it was important then, it's important now. Um, Hebrews 12, 14, we said, pursue peace with all people. Um, but then we said, be at peace among yourselves, 1 Thessalonians 5, 13. You know, as much as we can, live peaceably with all men, Romans 12, 18. But then notice what he says as well. He says in Hebrews 12, 14, without which no one will see the Lord. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty important, isn't it, to see the Lord. Yeah, without being righteous or sanctified, you won't see the Lord, and you can't have those without that peace there as well. It's not just a peace of mind, but it's a, a state of being at peace with God. Um, you know, the, the one that makes peace for us, that makes God accessible to us, is Jesus Christ. Um, he said as well, um, where was the other one I had? Um, oh, in the, in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. If you want to see God, if you want to be a son of God, a child of God, be a peacemaker. Now, we've talked about this before. That doesn't mean that we have to compromise truth. It doesn't mean, as many re religious groups have done, that we have to accept worldliness or immorality. We still stand for what's right. But we do reach out with love and compassion to people. We want, to, we want them to... Be at peace with us, but ultimately we want them to have peace with God. And um, you go back to Romans 12, 18. If it, is, it is, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Then we bring to verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another. Therefore, let us pursue the thing. Okay, this which makes for peace. What are the things that make for peace? Pursue the things that make for peace. What would be included in that list? What are some things that make for peace? And there's not just one right answer. I mean, there's maybe an ultimate answer, but what makes for peace? Yeah, that's one that we, I don't know about you, but I read and you say grace and peace and you don't uh, maybe emphasize the grace and don't think, of, you kind of jump over the peace part. Of course, those two go hand in hand. It's through the grace of God that we can have peace with God. But Paul saw it as very important. Like you, like, like you said, I mean, throughout his epistles, that's a recurring theme or blessing or something to pursue. But it, ultimate peace comes through Christ. But as you said, it involves a, a study and a learning of God's word. That's, that, that's something we need to pursue that makes for peace. It helps us to understand how to be at peace with God and our fellow man. What are some other things that make for peace? Unity? Unity? Common goals and what? Beliefs, okay. Verse of scripture is being of like mind and like faith. I mean, we we say we talk about that a lot. Um, I mean, or like mind, like heart. I should say. Um, the scriptures talk about you know be of the same mind and of the same heart. I mean, we have to have the same feelings, the same feeling of love and commitment, but also of the same mind, which is not just everybody believe whatever they want to believe, do what they want to do. It's the mind that marks it comes from God's word, studying God's word. Um, Okay. What is the unity of the spirit? Okay. The, the spirit-given word. Uh, 
the, the whole idea is, you know, you know, you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one, one God, unified. Jesus spoke as, you know, didn't say anything different than what the Father said. If you see me, you see the Father. Then I'm sending another comforter, and he's going to have the same message and, and fill in the blanks, if you will, on the rest of it. And so all that unity that's there, um, that oneness, and he calls us to that as well. Are we, do what? Kindness. Kindness. That's a, that's a lost art these days, isn't it? Um, I talk, I, now I have Rachel as my witness on this one because y'all question, question me sometimes with the stories I tell about the way people treat me in traffic sometimes. But um, we were going along the Eastern Boulevard the other day and I have no, uh, somebody went by me and is yelling and honking their horn uh, at, at me. And I mean, Rachel's sitting next to me, I go, what did I do? And she goes, I didn't see anything. I have no idea. And so neither one of us could figure it out, but they were mad for some, maybe I didn't take off of the traffic light in 0.5 seconds or whatever, I don't know. But um, you, you see that again and again, you see um, uh, rudeness, but kindness, be kind. You know, you see the little um, stickers sometimes, the little signs that just says, be kind. And um, that's a lost art, but it should not be. There's some, and that's easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you could fill in the blank with a hundred different things there. Uh, she said, if, you know, sometimes you just have to let certain things go because you, there's only so much you can do on certain things. Um, you know, there's such, uh, you know, sometimes you, you want to be able to work a situation out with someone or help them in their situation, and you realize, you know, I've done everything I can. I've tried to help in every way I know how, but <laughs> there's Nothing else I le left I can do. I, you know, you pray, of course, and, and you try to encourage, but sometimes if, if you, are you going to sit there and stress over it and worry over it, or are you going to pray about it and work on it and put it in God's hands? I mean, you know, there's, and we could list so many different things. They're not just in relationship-wise people and their spiritual lives. We can look at um, maybe even health issues or what, you know, str other struggles in life, but um, sometimes we have to, set certain, you know, just, I guess you say don't stress and worry over it. And um, it says instead of doing that, we, what we give thanks to God and, and pray to Him. The what? Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these overlap each other and they go hand in hand, but like I said, they all tie together. I mean, if we go have one, if we go have if you're going to have one of them, you have to have the others as well. You don't pick and choose on it. You know, it's like you go to, um, I was watching some commercial about, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, and I think it was an Aldi commercial. I'm talking about you don't have to pay a lot and then do that. And I, was, I was thinking, you know, you get to go to the store, whether it's Aldi or, uh, or Publix or even Walmart or the, or the, or the um, farmer's market. I need to throw in the farmer's market anymore. <laughs> but, no. but, you know, I mean, wherever you go, you can pick and choose what you want. And, and say, boy, you know, I'd like some corn this week. Or let's get some apples and some oranges. Or, no, we had the, you know, but you don't do that with the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, all these different things that are listed under the fruit of the Spirit um, go together. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. Things like love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and gentleness. You see how all those, like I say, kind of all fits together. And yet, does that describe us? I mean, you know, does that describe me? Does that describe you? You might say, well, sometimes it does. But that, that needs to be a characteristic of our life, that we strive toward that. Other thoughts on things that make for peace? Mm-hmm. Okay.
And you know, that, it really doesn't bother me as much. I mean, I feel sorry for the people that are hollering at me or whatever, or doing whatever, and see them do it. Uh, yeah, um, but then to read the stories about people killing each other on the road on road rage, I said, you know, it's one thing to have somebody yell at you, then another thing to somebody to kill somebody. But and it's not just there. You're talking about the don't avenge yourself. You got to give place to wrath, and let the Lord handle those things. But then he, in verse 20, he even goes another step there in Romans 12. Therefore, if your enemy hungry, if hunger, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. And so he says, go a step further. Don't just avoid doing negative. Don't just do it. Don't, don't hold a grudge. But he says, how about doing good instead? You know, return some good for evil. Okay. Okay. Yeah, humility is big in that. Um, oh, by the way, one more thing before we get out of Romans 12. And then he goes, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So don't let that attitude, over, bad attitude overcome you. But you overcome it, and then go the second mile. But be humble, you might say. You know, sometimes when we get the most upset, it's because our ego has been bruised or we've gotten embarrassed about something. I'm at... Um, you know, you know, you look at the things that Jesus, what did, what, in the scriptures, what made Jesus the most upset? Or what are some times you think of that he really got upset? The people in the temple? Disrespect for God. Okay, disrespect for God. I mean, when they looked at him in question, he, he would sit there and discuss it with them or even um, fuss at them some, but when it got down to that total respect for the house of God, and for God himself, I mean, he drove those money changers out. Um, in other words, you know, we can, get, we can get really upset or angry when our feelings are hurt or when people are hurting me personally. But what should hurt us worse would be when they're blaspheming the name of God or, or trying to, to hurt the name of God, you know, or, or, or the word of God. But don't give place to those wrong thoughts. Get, don't give place to wrath. Anything else before we move on? And again, I'm not hurrying. It, but any other thoughts? And, it go, and so Romans 14, 9, we pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. That's tied in with, how do we edify each other? First of all, what does edify mean? To build up? Okay. What are some ways that, what are some of the things that we can do to edify one another? What we're doing right now, okay? Studying together and talking together. Be what? Hum be humble. Okay. Right. Yeah, but you got up and let us on, didn't you? And did. You did fine. I mean, did good. I mean, did fine with it. And um, I, I think I heard somebody say, if Jimmy and Mark can get up there, I might as well. That was Glenn. I think if those two can, I can. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's encouraging, though. Is I mean, to, I mean, to realize. I mean, all of us have different talents and abilities. But you know, if if we get up here and um, try to lead a song, for instance, I mean, there's, the congregation will join in with you, and. and we'll, yeah, I know. You're talking about the people out here. Yeah, I'm talking about the, if we get up there, people will join in and help. But what if they don't? That's a discouragement, isn't it? Yeah. Because singing is to God, ultimately. But also, we, you know, we're worshiping God. He is the audience. We're worshiping him. But also, it says we teach and admonish one another when we sing. And so if we're not singing, we're missing an opportunity to teach and admonish and to encourage one another. Um, you know, it's an encour it's encouragement, I know, to the song leaders, but it's encouragement to all the members when you, when you hear the singing, I mean, it's, it's nice to, I'm up toward the front and I can hear it, or when I'm standing facing the congregation, you can hear it, um, to hear everyone sing. And, and not everybody, you know, 
Most are blessed with a better voice than I have, but just to hear people really singing from the heart is a wonderful thing. And you might realize, you may not realize it, that you probably sing better than you think you do. But that, that doesn't matter as long as we're making that melody in our heart. But that is a way that we can edify, build up um, one another, is to, to sing together. Other thoughts? You know, um, one discouraging word can do a lot of damage, but one encouraging word can go a long way as well. And, um, you know, you don't ever know what's going through somebody's mind or what's, what difficulties they may have, and you never know the power of just some positive words or um, some words of encouragement. Um, it may, you know, I, I've been at times when we, maybe sickness or other things going on, people say, well, we're praying for you. And, and they're not just flippantly saying that, they really mean it. And that means a lot. And um, to know some, you know, or somebody just to say something kind, uh, it, it's, an, it's an encouraging thing. Now, if, if you say something kind, somebody go, now what do you want? You might realize, maybe I haven't been encouraging enough lately. <laughs> but, um, you know, hopefully we're encouragers um, and are saying kind words. You know, I, you know, I've been around sarcasm all my life, and it's easy sometimes to tease and be sarcastic. But I have to remind myself, you know, not everyone likes to tease, not everyone likes the, the sarcasm, but even then, there's a time for being serious and a time for, I mean, always a time for love and for kindness and for goodness. Other thoughts there? It says after that, one of the obvious things that certainly will help us in our efforts to live peaceably with, with both God and man is godly love. Uh, Matthew 22, 37 and 38 you know, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so he said, look, you don't put first and foremost, of course it's God. You know, we want God to love us. We want God to forgive us. We want God to give us a home with him forever in heaven. But are we willing to give God everything, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and another place says all your strength. Are we willing to put forth everything everything and put God first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, this is the first. But then he, he, he explains the second one, like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, it's like it. So, and not that we love our neighbor with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but that it is a genuine love. I mean, it's, it's a pure, genuine love. You, you love him and desire for him or her, you know, the same that you would for yourself. What's it mean you shall love your neighbor as yourself? By the way, how, how do you love your neighbor as yourself? Some people don't love themselves. Well, they should in the right way. But how, what does it mean by loving your neighbor as, you, as yourself? Being concerned for their well-being. Being concerned for their well-being. Okay. Take action. Take action. Okay. You know, it's one thing to say, I love you. Or be, be warmed and filled, the scriptures say. But to actually help them be warmed and to help them be filled um, is a far different thing. Um, there's a lot of people struggling in the in the world today. I mean, a lot of, and it's not just the people that are out on the streets. I'm talking to um, Clay up in Nashville, and um, I think this morning it was two degrees actual temperature up there, and it had any the average across Nashville was eight inches of snow, and so he made his he had spent the night before the storm hit at the homeless center. He spent the night down there in an, an empty apartment that they have, and um, he said they were more than filled to capacity. I mean, like time and a half what they're supposed to have of people there. It's just amazing how many homeless that are in that area and how many people that are um, truly in need. I mean, for different reasons. I mean, you could have a long discussion on that, but it just amazed him at the overflow of people that were there just trying to find a place to keep warm. And that, that's in addition to all the different churches in that area that take people in during that time of year as well. And that's people that, you know, They've gone around in Montgomery, and I don't know, I've been noticing more and more homeless people in Montgomery, uh, for whatever reason. Um, I'm a little bit more open with it, I guess, I don't know. But, um, and it's amazing to me, some of the houses they've kind of set up in certain areas, whether it's tent or, or lean-tos, or some have started full construction in some of the woods. But, you know, there's, there's people that are hurting, not just homeless, but there are people that, um, the other day, like with, Mike, with Mike's, one of Mike and um, 
Maxine's neighbors, their, their mobile home burned down. You know, here's somebody else hurting. Um, we, um, they were, they had gone to Birmingham, their door, is it, one of their children has a regular appointments in Birmingham, for some stomach issues, they had gone up there, and while they were gone, the, the mobile home just burnt down, which may have been a blessing that they were gone, because um, they, they could have burned to death in their home. But, you know, you go over there and you, you begin to talk to them, and Mike called me, and the, the home's still smoldering when, when we were over there, and just that look of just shock. Uh, but now I, I talked to the elders, and the church gave some money to them to help them kind of, because um, all they had left were the clothes on their back and, and the car they were driving. That's it. And um, we reached out to them, and uh, we'll continue to reach out to them and make sure. But, you know, you, you look at people that are in need. I mean, they lost everything. But on the other hand, they still have all the family there. No, no one was hurt or injured in that, and that's a blessing. Um, and I think they realize that. And both of them still have their jobs where they're working, and, and that's a good thing. But, you know, there's people that are in need, people that are hurting, and they need some kindness shown to them. How would you want to be treated if, if your house burnt to the ground? You know, whether you have insurance or not, I mean, you know, you still, it's, it's a devastating loss with personal items that are lost that can't be replaced and just to having to start over again. I mean, we could talk about many examples, but there's an example. Um, love your neighbor as yourself. Romans 13, 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, a lot of our laws in our country are the thou shalt not, you know, don't, you know, you get in trouble for stealing, so don't steal. Don't speed. Uh, don't commit per perjury. Whatever it may be, you can get all that list there of things that you're not supposed to do. But now as far as the law saying you have to get out and do a lot of good, you know, do good to your neighbor, this, that, and the other, you can just kind of mind your own business and move on. Love, a part of love is not doing harm to your neighbor, but another part of love as well is to reach out to them in kindness and love and to treat them the way you want to be treated. Other thoughts? We um, go on from there. It says, this love is concerned for the welfare of another. He is even willing to put his own interest in a secondary place in order to keep peace. Both Abraham and Isaac had this kind of attitude. And it mentions in Genesis 13, 8, Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, herdsmen, for we are brethren. So what did Abram do? What did he tell Lot to do? Yeah, you choose where you want to go, and, and he chose the best, didn't he? <laughs> but really, it wasn't the best as far as his family. It was best from a cattle standpoint, but not from a family and spiritual standpoint. He made a bad, he, he looked at the wrong priorities there and made a bad choice, but it still called him a righteous man. But Abram could have said, look, I'm, I'm the uncle here. You're lucky I brought you along with me. You just need to kind of shape up, and if you don't, I tell you what, how much you go that direction, and I'll go this way. But Abram realized God's going to bless me no matter what, you know, and, and he just said, Lot, let's, let's be at peace here. And he knew, if I give Lot a choice, then what can he say then? How can he argue? How can he be angry when I said, when we say, look, you know, it's, we got to separate, but you choose where you want to go. I mean, that, that's really reaching out and trying to be at peace and, and being loving as well. Later in Genesis 26, 22, uh, you have the, um, the herdsman of Gerar quarreling with Isaac's herdsman, saying the water is ours. So he called, he goes on talking about the name of the well, and they quarreled with him, and they dug another well. They quarreled there also, and he called it a different name. Then he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So, and he says, the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So, hey, we're going to fight over the water. I'll just dig another well. We still go fight. I'll dig another well. On the way, um, Jesus talked about forgiveness until 70 times 7. Um, but the, the love, the peace that was there, or, or they strove for peace. And we're talking about people uh, of the stature of people like Abram, Abraham or Isaac. And yet they strove to live at peace um, with one another. Any thoughts over th those examples of Abraham and of, of Isaac? You know, you think about one of the great leaders in the Old Testament, Moses. Now, early on, he made excuses not wanting to go down to Pharaoh. But once it came to leading them out of bondage, I mean, you see a tremendous leader, um, you know, once they get across and, you know, um, go through the wilderness for those 40 years. But what was the reaction of the people 
to Moses? Did they appreciate him? They didn't, did they? Um, in fact, you know, they were ready to get rid of him and get a new leader and go back to Egypt once again. Now, if you're in that situation, they're wanting to get rid of you and get another leader, what would be the temptation? Goodbye and good riddance, right? <laughs> or when God says, how about I strike them all down, I'll make a new nation out of you. And you say, hey, that sounds good. What did Moses do? He prayed on their behalf. I mean, he, he um, you know, here he was, God saying, look, let's destroy them. And, and yet he, he, he pleaded on their behalf. I mean, that's a humble man. I mean, a very meek man, a powerful man, a great leader. And yet um, the humility he had there to not be filled, um, you know, the only time you, you see him really messing up was when he got angry and um, struck the rock, kind of took credit to himself. You know, you, you think about how frustrated he had to be at times. And yet through it all, he tried to... Um, to lead them in the right way and get them to do the right thing. I mean, you, you see the love that he had for the people and trying to bring them to God and to, to seek God's will. Um, so you look at people like Abraham, Moses, Isaac, and, and others. They may not have been perfect individuals. I mean, no man is other than when Jesus became man. But um, at the same time, striving for peace and striving with kindness for one another. Um, one other scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 7. <clears throat> now, therefore, it is already an older, utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? I mean, we, we look at our situation and we say, well, look, I'm trying to live at peace with people, but enough's enough. You, know, you reach a certain point, you say that boiling point, and you just say, enough's enough. What was going on at the church at Corinth? You had... Bre brothers taking a brother taking brothers uh, a brother taking another brother to court I mean brethren taking each other to court and he says why do you get a law against one another I mean you're going to a worldly secular judge to judge between you and a brother in Christ what did he say you should be willing to do instead of doing that allow yourself to be defrauded in other words but what if the other person is not right. <laughs> what are they taking advantage of you? What's he saying? There's something more important? I mean, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, it, it's easy to just say, look, you know, I'm going to fight you to the death. I'm going to fight you with every dollar I have. And, you know, I mean, but he's saying, are you trying to get along with one another and love one another? I mean, you know, we're so concerned about me, me, me and the material things that we lose sight of eternal things. And so the, that shows you the extent of it. Um, you know, be willing to be defrauded if you have to. I mean, you know, um, people will take advantage of us, but God will not. God is there for us, and we need to be careful that we have the right attitude toward God. Any other thoughts before we close out? We will finish up on peace and righteous living and we get the conclusion, and then um, as others are coming in, I'll go ahead and be handing out the the next worksheet, which is on long suffering. Any other question? We saw thee not. We've been talking about peace in the auditorium class for the last couple of weeks, and tonight we had some practical application on that about how to live at peace with all men and the kindness that we need to show and, and the attitude that we have. But ultimate peace that we should pursue is not just peace with men, but ultimate is peace with God. God loved the world enough that he sent his son to die for us. Christ died on the cross for our sins at the perfect sacrifice made for your sins and mine. You know, we can't forgive our own sins. I mean, we can't make them right with God because we've sinned. And so the way to make them right is through Jesus. We're baptized into Christ. We put on Christ, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 6 tells us. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's not just about the death of Christ. If Christ died on the cross but didn't rise up, we're of all men most miserable. I mean, if Christ is not risen from the dead, we really don't have any hope. If he couldn't rise up from the dead, then how can we expect to rise up from the dead? And, um, I mean, he says, if, if, in, if in this life only we have hope in Christ... 
We're of all men the most pitiable. He said, look, if there's no resurrection, there's no really purpose or meaning in life. But then he goes to verse 20, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. Christ didn't just die, he rose for us. Power over death, power over the grave, power over sin. And he's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. You know, you look at sin and the consequences of sin, the wages of sin is death, but through Jesus Christ we can be made alive. And we look forward to Christ coming. We look forward to an eternal home with God in heaven. The song we're about to sing says we didn't see Christ when he came upon this earth. We didn't see him live the life he lived to do the things that he did. We didn't see him being nailed to the cross or being raised up from the dead in the empty tomb. But we believe. I hope tonight that you do believe in Jesus, that he is the son of God, that he lived, that he died, that he rose, that he reigned, and that you understand the purpose of why he came. He came for you, he came for me, to offer to us a forgiveness of sins. And if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, why not become one tonight? Put your faith and trust in Jesus and obey his will. Be baptized into Christ for the mission of sins. Or if you need prayers as a Christian, prayers for forgiveness, prayers for strength, whatever need you have tonight, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Almighty God and Creator of all things, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that we've had to gather together to study your word and to encourage each other and lift each other up with songs and, Father, with knowledge of your word. Please help us to apply the things that we've learned into our lives to grow closer to you and closer to each other. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.